Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to my continued literary analysis of Cyberfrog, Blood Honey. I'm looking at the, the uh, stories that came from the Blood Honey campaign. If you missed my, my analysis of part one of Cyberfrog, Blood Honey, the actual book, you can check that out. I'll leave the link uh, in the description below and up above. But we're going to continue now with the Cyberfrog 1998 which I believe was the Ashcan. It was also part of this campaign. And this is unlike the um, Cyberfrog part one, which was in the perspective of Chel Sen, Cyberfrog's mother. Here we have, this is a diary of Heather Swain. It's, it's her diary, which narrates the, the coming of the Vespas from her perspective. This, this story, I think, if you want to look at all of the stories together, just thematically, I think this one has the this one holds together as the is the tightest arc thematically. They each have their own nice arcs. There's beginning and end, middle and you know, act one, act two, act three for each one. Um, you know, as sort of chapters should be. But this one I think uh, gets the most points for really clinging together as a as a thematic uh, cohesiveness. Themes in this story really from the beginning it hinges on sound. Sound just hits you in the face. You know, the, there's the uh, the Vespas want to be invited. They want consent from Earth, Earth before they invade, and they want it through this sound, this certain frequency, this buzzing. Heather talks about the white noise that they put in our in our minds, in our culture, you know, where it made it difficult to really even decide who we were anymore. Uh, so noise, noise, noise. There's uh, the gibberish who those, you know, later in the book, who's uh, those who are infected by the, the Vespas and their insides are liquefying. They, they're gibberish to their sound. There's heartbeat. All that Heather can hear is her own heartbeat when the Vespas come and attack. There's um, the heartbeat of Chelsen's heart, you know, the, the the tick tick and the and the um, the beat of the little piece of Chelsen's heart that she lay left there with Heather and Cyberfrog that you know, Heather's using to watch CNN on. So sound over again, uh, Salamandroids fighting shock roach, you know, shock the sound of electricity. Cyberfrog himself is fighting Traumadeus, uh, who's this musician uh, villain. So you've got that. You've got the buzzing of the pollinate, you know, the, the bee villains. Uh, actually, that's that's over in um, Cyberfrog book two. But, you know, that's that's still continuing the theme here. So so sound. Now, why sound? Because Cyberfrog is a very visceral story. I mean, there's a real horror aspect to these Vespas, these alien wasps coming in and injecting something into your body and through your mouth even to, to make your insides liquefy and your blood to become honey and your your body to be a dried husk that they can make for their their you know uh, nests and whatnot this is a very visceral this is very located in the body this is there's almost a, a very much a horror element to the story as well to a certain effect and that plays into the theme that we already start to build on last time what it means to be human you know, what it means to be human family, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Duty and honor and all of that. But but family and compassion and loves and those roles and caring for each other, you know. So so what does it mean to be human? Well, we have people literally losing their humanity. And it's not just that, because when that, whether we hear Chel Sen talk about losing uh, our, our humanity or the Vespas and what they want to do on Earth or whether it's it's Heather talking about it. It's more than just losing our bodies or losing our lives. It's about losing our culture, losing our, you want to say, rel religious systems, lo losing what made us human, lo losing the human spirit is really what, what it's about. I'm going to read this. Um, there's a couple text boxes, caption boxes here I'm going to read. It's, it's Heather narrating, and she's talking about you know, how they, they really just infused us with these white noise and they were looking for a certain frequency. And eventually it's this, this postmodern dance, you know, this one night that set off the right frequency and this uh, guy wearing a, or writing on his say soy bomb, you know, so that, that plays into another theme that we're getting here as well. But first, let me just develop this. So these are Heather's words. And pardon the light here. I'm just going to have it to read this. Heather's words talking about the, you know, the sound when it finally came and invited the Vespas. Maybe we thought we had it coming. Maybe we didn't believe it was even possible. Maybe some of us wanted to find out what it was to feel something again. We'd grown bored, complacent, spoiled. Our greatest heroes were memorialized in our past, and our worst villains had become black and white relics that we told ourselves we needed to remember, lest we find them reflected in ourselves. Self-reflection? Impossible. MTV, sneaker ads, and junk food, Oprah Winfrey's bromide placating the dumbest, cruelest, 
What were we even for? Why were we even here? When the Vespas came, they showed us the value that still remained in us. We were food for them, livestock, human livestock. Our flesh was dried, stretched, and used to build hives. My friends were supposed to stop them. So let's 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 unpack that for a second. You know, our our heroes, you know, are things of the past memorialized. You know, our worst villains were just these black and white relics. That's culture, right? I mean, you know, specifically talking about heroes and villains, so maybe heroes and villains in this universe, but it's really culture. You know, if you don't understand your past, if you don't understand your traditions, if you don't understand your heritage, your cultural heritage, then you don't know who you are. Because you know, is is the question then? Who are we then? You know, we're and we're and they were too too distracted to even really ask the question and delve into the deeply and find out because they were distracted by this and that, you know, and this story is set in 1998, obviously. So it's way more, you know, imagine how much more that is ramped up now in the real world, distractions and white noise out there everywhere, you know, distracting us. And, and that's a, that's a real commentary on our, or it's a, it's a way in which the Vespas do serve as a commentary on this kind of, however you want to apply it. Okay. Now I'm not reducing the story to an allegory. I'm not at all saying the Vespas, you know, represent this and that's what they're supposed to be in the story. No, these kinds of villains, these Vespas are really great pictures. This is what mythology should do. It should take a real world struggle or a real world challenge or whatever, and should recontextualize it in a way that can, that can get it a deeper truth of it. So think about the things we have to deal with today, the ideologues, the social justice ideologues, cancel culture, all of that. It's trying to eat away at our past, right? Cancel the, the past, you know, tear down all of the statues, you know, get rid of this, erase this from the history books, uh, erase the names, you know, do all this. We're going to change things around to the way we'd like it to be. Well, then what are we? You know, what are we? Well, you're what this new force tells you you are. It wants to inject its own desire for what you to be, you know, into you, and then it feeds on you, right? And uh, and that is what ideologues do they they can't create art of their own so what do they do they infect already previously established franchises our dearly loved stories they specifically go after the stories that, that values are built upon right let's remake those classics so that we can infuse our values in it and so forth you know the, the vespas come to earth they don't they can't make anything they can't do anything they can't add anything to earth all they can do is take what's already on earth and feed upon it uh and in the process ruin it totally totally ruin it. There's a great quote from book two of Cyberfrog Blood Honey that I'm going to talk about. Now, that's one way I'm contextualizing the Vespas, and other people have said this too. I'm not, you know, you know, blowing anybody's mind with this kind of thing, but it's um, it, it's a very valid interpretation. It's not the only interpretation. You know, that would make the book an allegory, and it's not that. Uh, it, it works as mythology should with multiple levels. So again, with the family theme, we, we have uh, the family of Heather and her friends, Sal and Amadeus, there's the fact that when she's uh, when the Vespas come, she's watching. Well, we'll get to that in a second. What she's watching that comes in book two. But maybe we should. Maybe we should kind of cover, um, you know, we're, we're kind of getting into both here. So maybe we should kind of cover Cyberfrog uh, part two and uh, the, the 1998 together here a little bit. I think we'll cover them in one go. She's watching Clinton. And, uh, you know, Clinton's the president in the 90s there in 1998, and it's his uh, State of the Nation address, or, or not the State of the Union address, but his, you know, announcement that, yes, he admits he did have an extramarital affair with Monica Lewinsky. Now, what is that? That's that's a break in family traditional values, right? That's a break in family. And that's no mistake that that's happening. And as he as he admits to that, and as he comes out with that and says, we just need to move forward, the Vespas come. And again, we've had a theme already built up of broken family. Heather Swain coming from a broken family, an abusive past. Uh, Cyberfrog and Salamandroid themselves not being the original intent of the Pradani or, or Chelsen. They were trying to get a, to find a human, you know, a Boy Scout. So they worked. It was it was a it was you make family out of what you have. It's not necessarily the perfect perfect view of it. But what makes family? It's not being of the same species. It's not being uh, you know of the same bloodline or whatever. It's really caring for other for each other. It's the true compassion, the true the type of compassion that Chel Sen actually feels for her sons, Trick Ron and Dudu Ron Ron. That's a it's uh the 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 compassion that Heather Swain feels for them and then the things the way that she and Cyberfrog inspire each other. That's what makes real family. And that's what this book's about too, right? It's not about um, you know, it's about fighting against that that which would dehumanize us. Because really you have in this story, you have monsters coming from space to dehumanize us 
and who fights against them humanized monstrous forms you know uh, it, it, i'm using that word monstrous and you know but cyber frog this big sort of monstrous like frog this monstrous like salamandroid and yet they're humanized they're humanized fighting against the monsters from outside which would dehumanize us it's a beautiful picture you, you see more of that uh, family aspect in 1998. Again, she meets, you know, as she's running for her life, she meets uh, Cooper and Cole, a father and son. And we'll hear more about them, of course, uh, and so forth. When we do get to the end of Cyber Frog 2, we, we learn that Heather Swain herself has had a daughter. So now she is a mother herself. We do know that uh, Chel Sen has, has been defeated there's her connection to cyber frog was severed at some point uh but there was that little piece of her heart that heather took with her so we're hoping that maybe we'll get a comeback of that again if you've read wreck planet don't ruin it for me in the comments i'm just just focusing on this now until i get this analysis out then i'm going to read and spend some time with and really try and delve into an analysis of wrecked planet and move on uh, to the rest of them uh, little books as, as i can get them i'd love to read all these little one shots and do analyses of them they get a little expensive and i've already missed some of them unfortunately i do have the uh the, the little horror Valentine's Day thing coming uh, that should be in the mail soon. I'd love to do an analysis of that by uh, by Valentine's Day. We'll see how that works out. But there's a Salamandroid one shot I've missed. There's some things that I'd like to get eventually to finish developing out this. But uh, so that is the the um, the the, the Cyberfrog 1998, you know, really um, twisting our traditions and our heritage, called down monsters that feed on humanity, you know, so our the, the twisting, the allowing ourselves to to lose our traditions and lose our our humanity lose our culture calls in monsters that'll feed on our humanity you know so you gotta you gotta as i've been saying read the classics you know uh get in touch with your cultural heritage and so forth you know what it means to be human just a few things on cyber frog uh book two specifically um theme wise you know a lot of the things i've already said in cyber frog one and cyber frog 1998 apply here there's one uh, scene in which Chel Sen is talking about, you know, when, when the Vespas have come and she's uh, she sees them, you know, she she tries to protect these human beings and she sees them come at uh, this this girl. And she says here, and I think this is uh, key because she's talking about the Vespas, their their plan, their their plot. And it's not just to conquer human life. I mean, listen to how she says this. She says the Vespas will obliterate all life and destroy all creation. They will perch upon the ashes of billions of broken hearts and dead dreams. They will revel in the misery while they lay more eggs. Okay, so that's not just an, an alien life form coming in and trying to feed on cattle and in just taking our lives to sustain their own. There's a real maliciousness there. It's wanting to stand upon broken hearts and dead dreams not just bodies but really breaking us down from the inside psychologically and, and then have reveling in the misery that they've caused again you know this is i'm contextualizing this you know right now is the kind of cancel culture ideal ideologues that we have but you can look at other challenges in the world you know that's what good mythology does it takes these these uh vicissitudes you know of, of the external world and, and recontextualizes them through story and then through doing that it shows us truths about it that we maybe didn't think about just thinking about the real life thing. There's also, you know, resonances in here in book two, Salamandroid, a wonderful scene where he's taking out the pollen eight, but they're robots, you know, and he's, he's very tricksters, you know, pollen eight. Oh, now you're pollen seven. Oh, now you're the pollen six. Now you're the pollen, you know, as he takes out each one and he's even taunting them. He says, it's a good thing. You can't feel this because you're robots. Again, you're not human. The villains aren't human. Salamandroid is human because he can feel right. You know, human that, you know, in terms of the, the, themes of the story here and and cyber frog is human because they feel they love they have you know compassion trust loyalty and so forth and uh and these villains don't you know to the extent even before the vespas come we've got robots that they're fighting the pollen eight you know pollen eight a lot of really wonderful wordplay in the in the story lastly in the in the book before you know as we as cyber frog is awakened and he realizes that so much time has passed and he's trying to find heather swain you know he's put the tracker on her and he's awakened in 2000 18 i think and he he finds her in the woods and we find out that woods you know we saw her at the end of uh 1998 meeting cooper and cole in the woods there but it's a safe place the woods are safe because the trees are around they can you know they can hide there better the the wasps can't maneuver the vespas can't maneuver with the close-knit trees and i think there's a picture there you know trees again the, the swamp 
where Chel Sen was, that primordial ooze from which, you know, humanity came, you know, you know, that's just the pictures of this kind of stuff. But then the trees there being so close together, you know, a family's, you know, humanity sticking together, being close knit. I think there's a real nice picture of that. Uh, you know, coming from the woods there and, and, and their, the, the care and the nurturing, you know, of nature is the thing that is a place where it's safe because the Vespas can't operate there, you know. And again, that's a commentary, I think, on, you know, the challenges that we face as humanity, as long as we cling to our humanity and cling to our, you know, relations with each other, that, that that's the answer. That's the answer. That's how you can uh, defeat the enemies and remain heroic. So this is just the first you know, again, first step into what is obviously a much larger story. I'm thrilled. I can't wait to dig into Rec Planet. Uh, I have gotten behind, but um, but pulling into Blood Honey again in, in 1988 just makes me realize, you know, man, I just love this so much. I can't wait to see where it goes. So I'm very much looking forward. I'm going to do Rec Planet. I've got the, the little Valentine's Day sort of love story, Heather Swain's uh, coming to me. I'm going to try and get other one shots that I missed and whatnot. I know, of course, part three is coming. I'm going to try and get as many of these as I can to continue this literary analysis of them for you guys. But I'm also going to do this kind of level of analysis on other stories, other comics and whatnot that uh, that really take my um, take my interest. I can't afford to just buy up everything, you know, every campaign. So I know everybody's going to say, oh, you need to review this, review this, and review this, you know, limited funds. So I can only really spend money on things that are strike my my interest. You know, like I said, Thomas Valiant from the fourth age is coming soon. And I'll, I'll look forward to getting into that and seeing what I think of that. And uh, yeah, but you can let me know what are some books that you would really like my take on. Again, no guarantees. It would have to be something that my taste is uh, triggered enough for me to want to buy that and spend money on it. And, uh, and we'll see, we'll go from there, but hopefully you like this new literary analysis format. I'll be doing a lot more of them and there's more to come of my usual live streams, podcast and uh, standalone videos. So thanks for watching. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into these true blue hero stories you love.